Thank you, Lord. Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 21. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 21 is our focus today. Particular, particularly the last two verses, but we'll read from verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, and uh, Paul is writing this letter from a Roman prison. He's in Rome, he's in prison, and he's writing to his beloved converts who live in Philippi, which was a city in Greece. So he's in Rome. He's writing to people who are living in Greece. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ, my chains, are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So I want to pose a question to myself this morning and maybe you might follow me and pose the same question to yourself. What is living to me, Paul says, to me, to live is Christ. The question is, what is living to me? Let's take Paul out of the equation for the time being. To me, John Mark Bartlett, what is living? Is it Christ? Lord, 
Lord, help us to grapple with real Christianity. It is time for us now to put away our toys. It is time for us to move past how we feel and how often we speak in tongues and the other sensational markers that we use and to delve deeply into the real stuff. Help us to leave the sandbox, the playground, and to get into the arena of real Christianity as you seek desperately to transition us from a feeling-oriented people to a faith-oriented people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And you may be seated, please. Paul, as we said, is writing to his beloved Philippian converts. He is informing them of the circumstances of his imprisonment in Rome. Paul is in prison. His imprisonment was not the result of him committing a crime. He was in chains for Christ. He was in chains for Christ. Most of us, I believe, do not see the prospect of ourselves ever coming to a place like this. But I want to suggest to us that it might not be too far off the horizon. The noose is being drawn ever tighter. The circuit is closing. And if you have sensibilities that are aligned to the Spirit of God, you will be able to appreciate it. At this time, I do not want to say too much about it, but it might not be too long before some of us pay a very high price, a very dear price for standing flat-footed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was in chains for Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1 and in Philemon verse 9, Philemon only has one chapter, he refers to himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ because he's writing from prison. But the words prisoner of Jesus Christ are in a construction in the Greek which implies that it was Jesus Christ himself who had made Paul a prisoner. I asked myself as I was dealing with this, in what sense could you be considered a prisoner of Jesus Christ? Paul did not consider himself to be a prisoner of the Roman Empire. He could have easily said that. In every reference to himself as a prisoner, Paul emphasizes the fact that 
as a prisoner, he belongs to Jesus Christ. He was imprisoned because he was engaged in the service of Jesus Christ. And for the sake of Jesus Christ, he was being persecuted. But Paul considered himself to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ before he ever went to Rome. I want to read in your hearing two passages based on how I feel inside. If you enjoy sleeping during messages, you're going to have a field day today. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, we find him trying to hurry to get to Jerusalem so that he can celebrate the feast of Pentecost. There he wants to reach Jerusalem so that he can celebrate Pentecost. And so he's hurrying. In verse 17, we find him meeting with the elders at Ephesus. And he's charging them. He says, you will never see my face again. I am leaving for good, and now I want to give you a solemn charge. And in verse 20, verse 22, sorry, he says to them, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. I go bound in the Spirit. I go bound in the spirit. I'm a prisoner. The spirit has me as a prisoner. I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So Paul says, I am bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. The Holy Ghost has me as a prisoner and he's directing me to go to Jerusalem. And I don't know what will happen to me when I go there. But in every city that I go to, as I make my way to Jerusalem, the same Holy Spirit witnesses that I am going to face bonds, chains, and afflictions in Jerusalem. So now, watch Paul's dilemma. The Holy Spirit on one hand has him as a prisoner and is leading him to go to Jerusalem. But the same Holy Spirit, everywhere he goes, testifies to the fact, Paul, when you get to Jerusalem, you're going to be in serious trouble. What does he do? What is he to do? What would you do? Wouldn't you have now exercised wisdom? Paul says in verse 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Paul was not saying, I don't value my life. He was saying, I place a very high price on my life, but not for me. The high price that I place on my life is so that I might finish my course with joy 
and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, none of these things move me. I'm going to go. Let's check him out a little later in chapter 21. He goes to Caesarea. He's getting closer to Rome. He's getting closer to Rome. He goes to Caesarea. And Luke says in verse 10, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, Paul's belt, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. That was a true prophecy. Not like the false ones we hear. Thus saith the Lord. Give me $20. 20 US. We're not talking about that. And when we heard these things, Luke is saying, when I and the brethren that were with me heard Agabus, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. Not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he could not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. So here is a man who is fixed. A prophet comes down and gives him a warning. The brethren who are spiritual men and who love him and are concerned for him say, Paul, please don't go. They begged him and he would not be persuaded because he was bound in the spirit already. Before I became a prisoner in a Roman prison, I was a prisoner in the Jesus prison. And I read these things and look at the little dolly house Christianity that I am involved in. The little plaster scene Christianity. The little building block Christianity. And I wonder if I'm ready for real, hard, X-rated Christianity. I wonder. Paul was assured that all the details of his imprisonment, including the outcome, whether it was to be a death sentence or an acquittal, were in the hands of the one who controlled the universe in the interest of the church. Those of you who follow us in our Bible studies, you would know what that means. These same hands were pierced for Paul. And he was engraved in the palms of these same hands. So Paul says, whatever happens to me, as long as I am in the hands of God, it's fine. And so he considered his imprisonment to be a very honorable one. He informs the Philippians that instead of him 
hindering the spread of the gospel. His persecution and his imprisonment had actually advanced the spread of the gospel. So the devil thought and men thought that by incarcerating Paul, they would be able to stop the spread of the gospel. But that was not what happened. The opposite happened. Paul is writing to reassure the Philippians. I know what you have been hearing about me, but I want you to know that even though my movements have been restricted, the movement of the gospel is gaining momentum. How did that happen? Realizing that Paul did not have the freedom to minister freely anymore, other believers had taken up the baton and were boldly spreading the message of the gospel throughout the city of Rome. So God used Paul's persecution and his imprisonment to spark a missionary zeal and fervor among the Christians in Rome so that the gospel was being preached in Rome like it never had been before. Now, the truth is that not all the preachers had the right motive. There were those who were not preaching sincerely. They were seeking to exalt themselves, to further their own selfish ambitions, and to stir up trouble for Paul. I have come to realize, brethren, that there are persons who will know the truth, and in a sense, believe the truth. But because, because they are mindful of an administrative position or a church position, they have to play the hypocrite. Their selfish ambitions will not allow them to say, yes, I believe that it is so, even though quietly in their hearts they know that it is so. But we must not be upset with them unduly because there are other areas in which we deny the gospel as well. Paul was aware of this treachery he knew that these persons wanted to stir up trouble for him, but he was not concerned for himself. As always, Paul's focus is on Christ and the message of the gospel, not himself. Lord Jesus, it is appalling how much our eyes are on ourselves. It is appalling. It is sickening, actually. Paul knew that even though the gospel was being preached with mixed motives, Jesus Christ was still being proclaimed. Even when the gospel is preached with a wrong motive, it will still still result in people coming to know Jesus Christ. So Paul emphasized the results, not the reasons. And so he was able to rejoice. See, Paul said, what is the result of this preaching that seeks to bring trouble to me? What's the result of it? If it is resulting in Jesus Christ being glorified, then it doesn't matter what happens to me. Lord God. The knowledge that his imprisonment was not hindering the preaching of the gospel, but on the other hand was causing an increase of gospel preaching was like a tonic to the soul of Paul. This awareness saved him from becoming discouraged. But still, 
he desired that the brethren in Philippi pray for his spiritual welfare. He's asking them to pray for him, trusting that the Holy Spirit would answer their prayers and minister to his spiritual needs in the midst of the difficult circumstances in which he found himself. I wish I could tear out of every pulpit every minister that preaches the prosperity gospel. But I don't have the power, so I only can pray for them. They have done so much violence to the word of the Lord. See, let me say this, brethren. There are persons in churches who are in the church and who claim to be serving Jesus because they want Jesus to be a stepping stone for them to fulfill the American dream. See, that's what Jesus is for, to prosper me and to put me in a position where I can actualize all my dreams and even some of my fantasies. So, the fellowship of his sufferings is not preached and not understood because what we want is a Jesus who will give us pancakes in a four bedroom house with three and a half bathrooms and a Mercedes in the driveway. And if he can do that for me and keep me relatively safe, I'll go on praising him. In verse 20, Paul begins to show us his heart. Philippians chapter, uh, he, he, he's, he's, he's dealing now with matters that are close to his heart. Chapter 1 and verse 20 he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. The words earnest expectation are the translation of a Greek word which describes a person whose head is erect and outstretched, who has focused on one thing and has turned away from focusing on everything else so that he can concentrate his attention on just one thing. It is used of the watchmen who stood on the city walls in the night time, peering into the darkness to see if, there, if, there could, if they could detect any trace of an enemy coming to attack the city. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. That, that was Paul's attitude as he wrote this letter. I cannot do anything to make Jesus Christ ashamed. And if I am not to do anything to make him ashamed, I cannot be ashamed of him myself. I would like to ask us who worship at the Grace Workshop Ministries to embrace the idea of being a fool for Christ. Embrace the idea that we will be thought of as non-entities. Embrace the idea that the world will see us as silly people, as foolish people, as dumb people, as misled people. Embrace the idea. We are fools for Christ's sake. Paul says. Yeah. 
in the difficult position in which he found himself as a prisoner of the Roman Empire, there was a danger of failure on his part. Failure to maintain the bold and fearless testimony which he had always demonstrated throughout his missionary career. There was a danger of that. The testimony didn't have to do with just his message, but with his life. Paul didn't want to be ashamed of Jesus. He didn't want to let Jesus down. No matter what situation he found himself in. Let me read another passage to you from 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 8, I will start at and read till verse 18. I told you that this message would be a good sleeping message for you. I am told that one pastor was preaching and one of the prominent ladies in the church was sleeping and he sent a deacon to wake her up. And the deacon said, no, sir, I'm not going to wake her up. It's not me put her to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Would you like me to come and wake you up since I'm the one putting you to sleep? This, this Paul is writing to Timothy from the same place, a Roman prison. But now, now, if you read chapter 4 of this same letter, Paul realizes at this time, this is a little later than the one we are dealing with in, in Philippians. Now, in, by the time he writes 2 Timothy, Paul knows that he's going to die. He understands that. He realizes that the tide has turned against me once and for all, and there's no escape. In, in chapter 4, he said to Timothy, I am my life is already being poured out as a drink offering. He said, I, I've, I've, I've finished my course. So he's writing to Timothy to prepare Timothy. And Timothy, by all that we read of in the New Testament was not of that bold and courageous personality as Paul. Timothy was somewhat timid. He was not that rough kind of fearless character that Paul was. So, so Paul actually has to shake him. And look what Paul writes in verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He says, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. People still have difficulty with it, but it's very plainly stated here. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Timothy, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. 
of whom are Phygelos and her Margines. Listen to verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Said Timothy, I'm not only telling you, giving you a charge, I'm showing you a man who was not ashamed of me, not ashamed of my chain. And sometimes when we are with some of our friends, we are ashamed of Jesus. Sometimes when we are in certain company, we don't want to hear praise the Lord. When we are at a certain situation, we at a certain station, we, we don't want to talk too much about the Jesus business because, you know, I, I'm here now. And I, I have been there. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not throwing words at you. And I have decided no more. No more. No more. You are the only thing that is eternal in my life. And I'm going to value you. And I'm going to own you in every situation. And I'm going to big you up everywhere I go. Yes, another Jesus fool is here. Oh God. I don't think I can get much further. John the Baptist. John the Baptist was in prison. He was in Machairus prison. Herod had imprisoned him because he had spoken out against Herod's marriage and Herod's lifestyle. And now he begins to go through a little period of being shaken. The enemy comes to him when he's isolated and says, Are you sure? that you really had heard from God? Are you sure that the Jesus that you pointed out is the one that should come? Things don't seem to be working out so well, John. Just look at your life. If Jesus was who you said he is, why are you in prison? Why are you being afflicted? You should be by his side. And for a time it seemed that John forgot his own words. He must increase and I must decrease. And so he sends men to Jesus. And they come to Jesus and they say, John says that we should ask you, are you the one that should come or should we look for another? This is John that pointed him out and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now doubts and fears afflict him and he's shaken in mind. Don't tell me that it can't happen to us. It happens to us for less, much less. We 
give upon Jesus for much less. Jesus. I probably have to pick this up next week. John is in trouble. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says, spend a few hours with me, you disciples of John. Spend a few hours with me. And they watched him as he healed and as he forgave and as he ministered and as he preached and as he did everything that Messiah was prophesied to do when he came. And he said to them, go and tell John what you have seen. The dead are raised. The deaf hear. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. And the messengers, I picture it this way, the messengers had started to run off and Jesus said, come back here. There's something else I want you to tell John. Tell John, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Remind a little, not a rebuke, but a, just a little saying to say, don't get crazy because you are in prison, John. The thing is not about you. No, don't believe that it is about you. Don't get offended because what you thought is not what is happening. Don't get offended because life isn't working out the way the preacher told you that it would. That if you got saved, God would give you a good husband. I didn't tell you that. That's what Bartlett told you. And you listen to that fool. Don't be offended in me, John. Because... This thing is about me. It's not about you. And for me to get glory, things will happen to you that are not nice. And that shouldn't be overly painful to you because I am going to have to be crushed so that good things can happen to you. Let me just say this, brethren. The Grace Workshop Ministries, as long as I am associated with it, I don't know what will happen after, but as long as I am associated with it, this Grace Workshop Ministries is not going to be a bling church. This is not going to be a star-studded church. This is not going to be a name-brand church. This is not going to be one of those circus tent churches. You understand me, brethren? This is going to be a church that if Jesus Christ cannot be glorified here, we shut it down. I want to say that so that nobody has any misgivings about what we are about. We stream live not because we are a big name. We stream live so that the message of grace and the message of the love of God can reach people effectively. People who would not hear it otherwise. We don't stream life so that we can make a name for ourselves. No service here is geared to making a name for anybody. If we cannot glorify Jesus Christ, I refuse to be a part of it. I prefer to die. I prefer to die 
than to be a part of a church that glorifies men. So, if you want to make a name for yourself, the Grace Workshop Ministries is not a church that you want to be a part of. You think I would ever start John Mark Bartlett Ministries? So when John Mark Bartlett dies, what happens to John Mark Bartlett Ministries? If I am involved in a ministry, it's going to have a name that can outlive me so that when I die, the ministry doesn't die. And if I die, and anybody is ever crazy enough to name any building or program after me, I will come back to life and shut it down. I... I embrace, you know that I love the old hymns and the old songs, but I embrace a lot of the modern music. And there's a song that I have been hearing. I don't know it well, but my daughter and my sons, I believe, know it. Something about, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care how they remember me, only Jesus. After I am dead, I don't care at all what is said or thought about me. I'm not living my life so that people will praise me when I'm gone. It doesn't matter to me what people say about me. I'm dead. I told my wife when I die, she's to bury me in Maypen Cemetery. And she says, no, she's not going to do that. So I have given her peace. I said, bury me anywhere you want. But I really want to go to Maypen. A few thousand dollars and it's all over. You don't have to break a bank for me when I die. You don't have to bury me on a Saturday either. Lord Jesus, let's stand. Brethren, hear me. Is there anybody in this building today who as you live out your Christian life, you find yourself in situations where you are tempted to be ashamed of being a Christian? By the way, do you know how many times the word Christian or Christians appear in the Bible? Does anybody know? Three times. In Acts chapter 11, the Bible says the believers were first called Christians at Antioch. Antioch. And it was a term of, it was a derogatory term. It was say, it was, you Christians. King Agrippa, when Paul witnessed to him, he said, I'm, I'm sorry, folks, it's not, even a song was written about it, a hymn, almost. That's not what Agrippa meant when he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The spirit of what Agrippa was saying, Paul, do you think with these few words you can convince me to become a Christian? He, Agrippa was not under conviction. I'm sorry. And then Peter uses the word to say, if you have to suffer, suffer as a Christian. What is the term that describes believers? If you ask Paul, who is a believer? 
he wouldn't say a Christian. He would say somebody who is in Christ Jesus. In Christ. All, Paul, Paul uses that term more than 160 times. In Christ. That's what it means to be attached to Jesus Christ. That, that's what a Christian really is. Somebody who is in Christ Jesus. Ask the person, tell the person beside you, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Tell them, own him when you are with your friends. Own him when you are with your friends. Tell somebody, speak of him on your job. Tell somebody, when you go to a restaurant or to Wendy's, pray and let them see your praying. Don't say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pray and let them see your praying. Bow your head and pray. Honor God that way. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. We, we repent, Lord, for every time we have been ashamed of you. For every time when we cringed and tried desperately not to allow anybody to find out that we were Jesus' people. We, 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 we ask you to forgive us for the many opportunities we have lost to speak of you and to magnify you because we were afraid to be ashamed. Imagine that, Lord, we who were dogs and sorcerers and who were mongers, dead in trespasses and sin, to be ashamed of the one who called us out of the darkness. Forgive us, Lord. Give us, give us a love for you, a conviction about you, a boldness in our spirit. To be happy to be identified as one of them. Because there will be a day when all of those who make us feel ashamed now will be nowhere around. And we will be in your presence. Bless your people, Lord. Help us in a special way to be, to be who we say we are. Keep us from being lifted up in pride. Keep us from, save us from ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless your brethren.